collecting drawings. You may have heard the saying, good artists copy, great artists steal. It's been attributed to Picasso, Steve Jobs and any other scoundrel you care to think of. But before them, the poet T.S. Eliot wrote in his collection of essays, The Sacred Wood, to imitate was shoddy, but to steal was praiseworthy. And that may be possibly the origin of the idea. What I think it means is that rather than trying to be someone else, you take ownership of what you see and it becomes part of you. I often quote the saying that we all stand on dead men's shoulders. And so when we look at fellow artists' drawings, we draw on their innovations and then they come into our own drawn language. This is how art moves forward. Long before mass travel, many artistic innovations were spread through drawn copies of pictures. Art is a visual language that we learn through seeing. Not long ago, I bought a drawing by the artist Geraint Evans, and I'm really enjoying it. Here it is. Nice. It's a drawing he did at the Green Man Music Festival, which was held in the Brecon Beacons in Wales, and is near where he hails from. I love his use of line, the feeling he achieves with differing pencil marks, and how he uses empty space in the composition. It reminds me that I've always something to learn. There's nothing unusual about buying work from fellow artists. Claude Monet, Pierre Auguste Renoir, Edgar Degas, Edouard Manet, Camille Pizarro, Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso all owned works by Paul Cezanne. Lucien Freud owned work by Camille Corro, Edgar Degas, Francis Bacon, Frank Arbuck and Mike Andrews. Damien Hirst has quite a nice collection that was shown at the Serpentite not long ago. Not work that I would have bought personally, but I'm sure that there were pieces he was pleased to get. Financially successful artists can buy a painting and through a continuous period of ownership have the chance to really absorb what they see. But nowadays the best works of the old masters have got too expensive for most of us. People who inherit very valuable works often can't even afford to insure them. And if they can't find a museum to lend them to and who will therefore cover the insurance, they have to sell them on. And so the best works drift upwards out of reach of individuals and have mostly ended their journeys in national collections. Organisations like the Getty in Los Angeles dominate the market. Their endowment of $3.1 billion is held by a trust that requires it to spend the full income, which at present totals $140 million a year. <laughs> so what hope is there for the rest of us? We must think creatively. Do you even have to own the pictures to enjoy collecting them? You could just save pictures off websites to a folder on your computer. That would certainly solve the insurance issue, but it does open up the question of copyright. When I was a youth in Hong Kong, a girl asked me to a party. I was slightly surprised to find on arrival that I was there as her date and that it was her oldest sister's birthday. There were three sisters and each had a date. The other two guys were a US Marine and a British Army squaddy. I was at art school at the time and was clearly not what the parents had in mind for their daughter, but they were polite and showed me the pictures in their house as they thought I'd be interested. There were four. They were jigsaw puzzles, 
that when completed had been framed and hung on the wall. So we went round each in turn while I tried to think of something complimentary to say about each one. I felt very uncomfortable that evening. I'd spent my childhood in relative privilege and for some reason I thought that everyone had real paintings in their houses so I needed to recalibrate my understanding of the world. Now, there's a difference between a constable hanging on your wall and a jigsaw of one. But there are many shades in between, and you must cut your coat to fit your cloth. When I reflected back on the idea of collecting framed jigsaws, I found it easier to imagine them as framed prints. And for some people, a print of a painting will be enough to remind them of a great work they know and love. For others, only an original done by the artist will do. Of course, you could go on living without any pictures altogether. If you look through the pages of Good Taste magazines, you'll find photos of architects' houses, and you may notice that they hardly ever have pictures on the wall at all. <laughs> no, thank you. I think many architects hate paintings. They want the entire stage to themselves. But paintings in houses fascinate me. I get such pleasure in looking to discover aspects of my host that I otherwise would have missed. You can also discover yourself through collecting. It can help you to understand and recognise your own likes and dislikes. As art students, we often collected postcards of paintings. Some were discarded and others became firm favourites and we would stick these to the studio walls to inform our work. Collecting art can also be about how you present yourself to the outside world. I have one friend who managed to create a collection of paintings by some of the greatest British artists of the 20th century by buying them at knockdown prices at auction. This was not good. All artists do a bad picture every now and again and he'd managed to find and collect some of the worst examples of each artist. <laughs> this is a mistake collectors can make when thinking of art as an investment and trying to do a profitable deal. An even worse mistake can be to be allow an art dealer to tell you what to buy. So there are regular galleries where people show pictures and you go in and you find something you like and you pay for it and you take it home and enjoy it. But there are other galleries that claim to offer you investment opportunities and then play sophisticated games like only selling to pre-approved clients. These are shark infested waters. They'll just use your money to prop up the price of paintings they themselves have collected and use your purchases to support the prices in their own collections. Another option that's been developing is to consult an art advisor, someone employed to act for you in creating a collection. This would seem a good option for someone with lots of money but not much time to use it. They act for you in your interest to get you the best prices and save you from buying works dealers have had kicking around in their storerooms for ages that they can't shift. A good art advisor will act as a personal tutor helping to educate you and find your unique taste. A possible downside is that you end up with a collection of the greatest quality, but very little character. In my view, the collections which really speak to me are an eclectic mix and contain a few pictures of no particular value, but the owner just liked for some reason. A bit like someone who has a beautiful face with something just a bit off, such as wonky ears, that makes you love them just that bit more. It's something that's very hard to fake, but is what makes us human. Understanding your own taste can be a slow 
evolving process. When people have built up experience in collecting, it becomes a creative act in its own right, and the collection takes on a separate life of its own, beyond the character of the original works. You get to see this sometimes in collections that have remained reasonably intact, such as Dennis Eyre Bower's collection at Chiddingston Castle in Edenbridge in Kent, the Frick Collection in New York, and the Wallace Collection in London, and indeed these are some of my favourite museums to visit. If you are reasonably rich but not able to afford an old master, you can probably afford an old master drawing or two. The nuances of line and character are often much easier to read in drawings than in paintings, and it will probably bring you a great deal of satisfaction to really get to know the piece. <laughs> Back to the Garant Evans drawing. If, like me, you are always broke, but occasionally get your hands on a couple of hundred quid, then drawings by younger artists may also be within your reach. There's an added bonus here. Buying a picture from a struggling artist will help them, and I know from experience how grateful we are. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Garant should be grateful to me. I'm actually grateful that he sold me the drawing, which has enabled me to commit an industrial espionage. <laughs> But I can tell you that at my first ever exhibition, the artist, Paolo Rego, bought a still life of a Japanese doll that I'd done. And it remains to this day one of my proudest moments. And it gave me the much needed encouragement when times were hard. On this occasion, it was more than just the money. Thanks, Paolo. I know you're up there. <laughs>